All right, so uh, we're going to finish up chapter three today, hopefully. Uh, and so the last level is the structs level that you should not be able to, well, some of you have done it already, but that was <laughs> uh, more proactive on your part. Um, so I'm going to talk about structures and how they're laid out in memory uh, and how they're accessed in assembly. Uh, so, uh, to recap, structures are basically a complex data type defined by a programmer. Uh, keeps together and organizes pertinent data of a particular object. Uh, and it typically consists of very simple data types or other complex data types. So you can embed structs inside structs. Um, it's similar to a class in C++ or Java, if you've programmed in the object-oriented languages, uh, but without the methods. Uh, that's specific to OOP. Uh, so here's an example from graphics, a point with two coordinates, x and y. Uh, you have uh, an x-coordinate that's a double, a y-coordinate that's a double. Uh, x and y are called members of a struct point. Um, and so after you declare this struct point, you can then declare instances of the struct point using struct point p1 and p2. So this is your uh, sort of your definition of your data type and then instantiations of it. So given what you know about the size of doubles, uh, what is the size of this struct point in bytes? In bytes. Uh, in bytes. 16. 16 bytes. Yes. So. 8 bytes on the double, so so 64 bits, 8 bytes. All right, and then 8 bytes twice is 16 bytes. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Does that mean that the, the struct pointer actually points to the first object, the first thing inside of it? So it's actually uh, pointing... Point is being used differently here than pointer. No, no, no. I know. I'm just saying that that means that the first part of that object... That oh, yeah. Uh, the double X, yes. Yes, we'll get, in fact, we're, we're going to get to that layout in memory. Okay, uh, accessing structures, and this is a recap from the C uh, part of the, the class. So here we've uh, de defined a point and then have an instance P1 of it. Uh, and you can use the dot operator on the structure uh, to obtain its members. So if you actually have an instance of a struct point, you do P1.x, P1.y to initialize its members. Uh, if you have an, a pointer, to that struct, then uh, so here is a pointer to a struct point, and that's the address of P1. Uh, then you can either access the members of that struct using the dereference operator star pp uh, dot x, or the short form using the arrow operator, the dash greater than. So these two are equivalent. Um, when you want to initialize structures, it's just like other variables where you can actually, in order, initialize x and y uh, together. All right, so that should be review of what a struct is. Uh, as we said earlier, structures can contain other structures as members. So if I have a rectangle with a bounding box and I have two points that define the bounding box, that way, that way, uh, what is the size of this struct rectangle? 32 bytes. It's just two struct points, and each one of these are 16. Um, structures can be uh, passed as arguments to functions. And just like all of the other data types, uh, structures are passed by value. You're going to copy that struct onto this, uh, potentially onto the stack. Uh, and, then, and then you're going to uh, basically allocate space for that in, in the function argument. Uh, this is different than arrays, right? Because in arrays, you're passing the name of the array, which turns out to be an address, and that's actually a reference. Mm -hmm. So with a struct, if you pass struct point two as a parameter, it's going to copy that struct uh, in there. Okay. So uh, what about this code? Uh, so here we have a struct that contains two arrays, two large arrays. Uh, if I call, so I define this struct as foo, and then I call a function with foo as an argument. What does that do? Pass by value or pass by reference? It's passed it pass by value. It's the two pointers, so it's like A and B, right? It's passed. So the question is, is do I copy 400 bytes 
uh, and then pass it to Funk, or... Because and are pointers to places in memory. We got some, com yeah, so some yeses and some noes. Uh, and some I don't know. What's it? And some I don't know. And some I don't know. And this is a function here that's going to allow us to check. So here's the function. It's a recursive function. And the reason why it's recursive is because what I want to do is if I'm given a parameter, t, then I want to figure out the address of t dot a as a pointer and the address of t dot b as a pointer. And then I want to call func of i minus 1 using the exact same struct. Now, this is a recursive function. It goes down to 0, and then it comes back up. And every invocation has, uh, it's going to pass t into func. Now, if this was passed by reference, then it would be the exact same address mm -hmm. every single time. If it's passed by value, it would be decreasing values as you push these arrays onto the stack. Okay, so here we go. We're going to compile and run this, and we're going to get this. Which is what? Pass by value. It is copying those 400 bytes. If you look at this, it goes from 8D0 down to 720, and this is hexadecimal, down to 570. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, uh, do I have this here? Here's the object dump. So the proof is in the in the assembly code. Uh, look at the code that is used to call func. Uh, I haven't actually given you this repeat instruction, but basically this thing is uh, getting the address of foo. It's saying, hey, I want to actually uh, set this counter to 50, and 50 is the number of times I'm going to repeat this move sign quad, and I'm basically going to do a copy of 50 quad words, which ends up being um, 400 bytes, <laughs> and I'm just going to copy that onto the stack, and then I'm going to call funk. That's, it's interesting that it does the whole thing rather than, like, like it's copying several chars at once, too. Yes. Right? That's yep. kind of cool. So yeah, it's using this special instruction. So it's not doing one byte at a time. It's like, gosh, I got, I got 400 bytes here. I'm going to do it one quad word at a time. And not only that, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to use this repeat instruction because I know this is fixed length. I can say, just repeat this 50 times. So it, it actually helps in the branch prediction, actually. <laughs> yeah. Where does... RCX, is, this is the counter. So this hex 32 is decimal 50. And because you're moving quad words instead of bytes, it all works out. The math works out. No, no. How is that? How is that actually keeping count of it, though? That uh, every time. So the this instruction will decrement ECX implicitly by oh, one okay, every that's, time you execute it. That's the, so that's the shortcut. Now, I didn't really talk about this, but this is actually how you do this copy without having this conditional branch all the time. Uh, yeah. Um, if there were dynamically allocated arrays. Uh, it depends, yeah. Uh, because then it's an actual pointer, right? Uh, dynamically allocated arrays. So if it was car star A, car Yes, star okay, then it's passed by reference because you're passing, these are two references to arrays. So the struct, if these were two pointers to that you then filled in with after you pointed to malloc uh, memory, then the size of this struct would be 16 bytes because it'd just be two 8-byte pointers. And that's, that's, Passed by reference, but you're, you're basically copying the value of the pointers uh, in there. Okay, so arrays within structures are passed by value, whereas arrays by themselves are passed by reference. Uh, is it because structs are actually like dedicated memory space for like you're essentially just defining a new type almost? Uh, it's because you can name a struct and it actually points to the real object. When you use the literal of the array by itself, it's just assumed to be the pointer. So if you want to pass a struct by reference, you have to go and pass, uh, pass the address explicitly. Of the struct itself. Of the struct itself, yeah. <clears throat> or, or I should have gone forward. You need to do this. <laughs> so here, I have, uh, again, I have my two arrays A, 
And then I have a pointer uh, AP, and I set it to the address of A, and then I call func of 2 with AP, and then within this function, I reimplement this taking a pointer, and then I print the pointers, the addresses at, you know, the address of T uh, arrow A and the address of T arrow B, and then I recursively call. And of course, when you run this, this stays the same because you're passing by reference. Question. Um, how does it actually, where inside of the compilation process does it actually say this struct is actually these things? Has this structure? Is that like preprocessor? Is that assembler? Or compiler? That's the compiler. It is the compiler. Yeah, that it is the compiler. Uh, and it's parsing this declaration and saying, I know exactly how to lay that thing out in memory. And I know exactly how, when it's used in these function calls, I know exactly how to marshal the data into that function call to do it statically. Okay, and then uh, when you do the object dump, it's moving the two into a register and it's moving the stack pointer into the register, which is basically the uh, what this thing is pointing at. So, and you're done. Okay, uh, operations on structures. Uh, the legal operations are you can copy a structure uh, via assignment. This is equivalent to a memory copy. And this is different than strings, which you can't do like that. You have to actually explicitly call a string copy on strings. But on structures, you can do this. Uh, you can get its address, as we saw it before. You can access its members. Uh, the things you can't do, uh, compare the content of two structures in their entirety using the double equals. Can't do that. Uh, you have to compare the individual parts. Um, and then the other thing is with structure, uh, with operator precedences, uh, the dot and the arrow have higher precedence than most of the other operators. Uh, and of course, I'm gonna bring back your, uh, the, the list of operators over here. Uh, and you see the arrow, the dereferencing and the uh, or the structure following is towards the top. So this is always helpful to know uh, as you're parsing C code. Okay. Oh, that's an accumulated XOR. These are assignment operators. So when you're doing the assignment, oh, the assignment goes last, right? That would make sense because you have to have the XOR, but you can't have it be the same thing as what we have, the overloaded. It's an accumulated XOR, if you want. They are on there twice, and I don't know why. That's uh, no, pro one is pre 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 Well, one's post, one's pre, probably post and then pre. Uh, so, prefix, increments first, then sets everything out. Post so, fix, here's the thing. I deleted the description from the slide, but if you go back to the arithmetic, uh, I, I basically pulled these from the other lecture, and I actually might have copied and pasted. Uh, yeah, and I don't know which, and the description got deleted, so. Right, well, I'll fix that again. Uh, that's a brand new ad. <laughs> All right, so uh, one of the things that you'll see with structures is that they'll be type def. So type def is a keyword in C that allows you to define your own types. Uh, so when you do something like this, type def int length, you're creating a new type called length. You're not creating a variable length. You're basically treating that uh, name as a new type that you're defining. Okay. So after you do this type def, then you can use uh, the length as a type and then side a. And you've seen this already with this size underscore t uh, or the, the time underscore t. Those are type defs that say, hey, use an unsigned integer uh, for this. Um, so when you have it with structs, you can do something like this, where you have a type def struct node, uh, and you define the structure of the node, and then you, you name it. You name it my node. And then subsequently, you can use my node td rather than struct node td in your declarations. And it's sort of more compact, and you can make it more descriptive. Mm -hmm. Putting the my node at the bottom just makes it so you don't have to say struct node td. Right? All the time, yeah. Okay. And so it's just a, it, that, is that part of the, that almost looks more like a preprocessor sort of thing. Like a, the, the Still a compiler thing, though. 
Yeah, and if it doesn't have a hash, t a hash mark in there, this, the preprocessor is mostly string substitution. Uh, I guess that sort of is string substitution, but yeah, not done typically with a preprocessor. Okay, um, one of the things that you'll often see in C code is self-referential structures. So if you think about a linked list, you have a pointer that's going to point to the same object that it's contained in. So you need this sort of self-referential uh, definition. So this is how you would do it. You would have a struct T node. Uh, it's con consisting of uh, two items, a character pointer and an integer, and then a pointer to the next struct T node. And this, because it knows that this is an eight byte quantity, this, this uh, struct T node pointer, it's able to parse this even though it's sort of recursive. Uh, no, you don't need, so I could have said, so this is my node, this could have been, um, I believe it can be my node, no, no, in, inside the type def it has to be struct, you have to spell it all out, and then after that you can use the name, yeah. Okay, okay uh, so that is uh, structures in C, um, we're going to talk about how they're implemented, uh, in assembly. Uh, so the concept is similar to arrays. You contiguously allocate these uh, uh, members of this struct uh, in, in memory. Uh, and so you, the members can be uh, a variety of types. And once you define a struct like this, the compiler can then statically generate the code to access the structs based on how you're using it in the program. Okay. So here's a struct, it's got an integer, it's got uh, an array of integers, and it's got a pointer to an integer. So here is your first integer i, first four bytes. And then uh, you have an array of integers, and this is going to be 12 bytes, right? Since e each of these ints is four bytes. Uh, and then your pointer has is eight bytes. So from 16 to 24, so sort of the whole data structure is 24 bytes. Okay. Uh, this is how you would access uh, a particular structure member. So in this case, you have a function down here that sets i. So given a pointer to this record, r, and given a value, you're going to set r arrow i to this value. And in assembly, uh, you'll see that the struct, the pointer to the struct is an rdi. The first argument is our rdi. The second argument is an rsi, or esi because it's an int. And so the assembly to do this is a move L, uh, ESI, which is the value, into parentheses RDI. And the reason why you're using parentheses RDI is because the very first uh, memory location that R points to is this integer I, and that's exactly what you're setting down here. So this is the one, one instruction implementation of that function. Yes? I have a question. So, if you had like a pointer in the beginning, like you said, had the I had a pointer. Mm -hmm. So, how would would be the memory layout? Because I remember from the CTF where it was like I had uh, to struggle to figure it out, and I someone told me, me, no, no, that's not how you allocate. <laughs> because I was like computing. Now I have twelve bytes, but it wasn't twelve; it was twenty-six. And I was wondering why they twenty-six. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, oh, this is these are uh, specifically chosen sizes to make sure that so it all works out in this case but yeah we'll get to your case uh yeah <laughs> that's my bad for giving that structure uh assignment too early <laughs> all right but we're i'm going to answer that question uh soon okay so here is another function this says find an element in the array a so the index is an integer and then you're given a pointer, and you say, hey, I want you to return the address of r arrow a of index. And what you really want, visually, is to go into this array a and get the idx element out of it. So to do that, what you want to return is r, which is the base, plus 4, which will skip the integer i, plus 4 times the index, which indexes you into this memory to get the idx element. So you would like this to be returned in RAX, 
when you do this implementation. And this is what you get. Uh, you have R as an RDI. You have the index is stored in ESI as the second argument. So the first thing that happens is that you take four times the index and put it in RAX. This gets you the offset into A of that integer that you want. And then the LEA quad four plus RDI, that gets you, the RDI gets you to this location, the four gets you to this location, and then if you add that to RAX and stick the result in RAX, you're returning the address, the proper address. Yeah. Couldn't you use all four arguments of the parentheses to actually put all in one step? You could do that all in one, yes, okay. instead of two steps. Was, like, confused, was... Yeah, yeah, maybe I didn't put the optimizations on, on, on this one. <laughs> but yeah, you, you could actually try and use, yeah, you, you could actually put four that. ESI, okay. RDI, four, and then put that into REX directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Is yeah. that passing the pointer? Yes, it is passing the pointer to R. If you look at the function arguments, it's saying I'm taking a pointer to that object. Returning the pointer, but is, is, it, is it returning? Is it, is oh yeah, you are also the returning the pointer because this is the address of, the, of that. That's the address R, but R is a pointer. So is it the address of the pointer? It's the address of R arrow A of index. So this is evaluated oh, okay. before, so well this is evaluated first. And then this is evaluated, and then the address is. The address of our uh, DRF array. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, let's have you try this. Uh, this is practice problem 339. Uh, there's some scrap paper up here. Uh, how many total bytes does this structure require? And then what are the byte offsets of each of the fields? So P x, y, and then next. Uh, and then I want you to reverse engineer the following C code. Um, based on the first two assembly instructions, what is the first C statement? And then based on the next two assembly statements, what is the second C statement? And then based on the last statement, what is the third uh, C statement? Okay. Um, so the first one was 24. Uh, you have eight bytes here. Ah, wait. You have eight bytes here. You have two four-byte quantities here. So that's 16. And then you have another eight bytes here for this pointer. That's 24 bytes. Uh, the offsets of the following fields, uh, and because they're stored contiguously, uh, the offset of P is zero, is at the base. The offset of this integer X, well, the size of this pointer is eight bytes, so this offset should be eight. Uh, the offset for Y, uh, again, eight plus four is 12, so this offset is 12. And then the next pointer is at eight plus four plus four, so this is at 16. Now the reason why we're calculating these offsets is because they're going to be used directly down here to access these uh, structs, so it'll help you reverse engineer uh, these things. So uh, let's take the first two instructions. Uh, you go to 12 RDI. What's that 12 RDI? Well, it's S dot Y, right? You're going to move it to EAX, and then you're going to move EAX into 8 RDI. What's that 8 RDI? Well, that's S dot X, and that was what this was, S P arrow S dot X. So you're going to set that equal to S P arrow S dot Y. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, the next two, uh, LEA quad 8 RDI into RAX, and then you move that into parentheses RDI. 8 RDI, the, so this is going to generate an address uh, and that address is this location 8 plus RDI. 8 RDI is s dot x. So you're getting the address of this. And then you're storing it at parentheses RDI. Well, what's at the base? This pointer P. So this is s p arrow P. What does that get assigned to? It gets assigned to the address of s p arrow s dot x. Yeah. Yeah, so 
Again, this is a nonsense example, just for, for, uh, <laughs> just, just, yeah, yeah, nonsense example, no problem. Uh, and then the last one, uh, move RDI into 16 RDI. Well, what's in RDI? It's actually uh, SP. So this is, and then at 16 RDI, you have your next uh, member. So SP arrow next is equal to SP. Yeah, it's pointing it. <laughs> it's pointing to itself. <laughs> a great function. Uh, it's too bad it's hardly ever used. Uh, okay. Um, so and this is going to get to the level. Um, when you have structures and members of structures inside of it, uh, the data inside the struct they all have to be aligned at very specific offsets in memory, and there's a reason for this. Because in the end, every access to a member is going to hit the memory subsystem, and it's going to be somewhere stored on memory chips. And you would like your access to that data to be done in one access, one memory access. There is a problem when you've organized your data so that half of it is in one row of memory, and then the other half is somewhere else in the next row. So the idea of aligning data in memory is to ensure that you can get these members in one access. Um, so uh, the explanation is that all, all of the low-level memory accesses are done in fixed sizes and fixed offsets. And so what the alignment enables you to get this in one access. So here's an example. If you store a long integer at hex 0, at the base of memory, uh, then a single memory access can retrieve that value. Uh, but if you, for example, store that long at hex 4 or at the boundary of a page, then you're basically going to require two accesses to get the both, both parts of it. Okay. So that's the intuition for aligning members inside of a struct. Yeah. How big is that memory? How much memory is like, are they like, how many memory is stored? Groups of 64 bytes, maybe lines of 64 or lines of, you know, 16 bytes. It depends on the underlying thing, but usually it's a power of two yeah. uh, on the bottom, which means that your access size, like you should try and align your data so that it, you can guarantee that it fits at least in a, in a row, and that's the that's the alignment. Oh. Um, um, so right now, think of memory as structured rows, and then you want to make sure your data type fits and is guaranteed to be in one and only one row. Because otherwise, you'll end up, if it spills over across two rows, then you'll have accesses in, in both. Is one row being like... A physical a memory bank in, in memory, for, oh, okay. for example. So this is different when they have to look at memory as one array at each. Yeah, yeah, that there's no underlying structure that stores the memory. So conceptually, it's like, yeah, a, a, a big blob of memory. Uh, but as it turns out, memory, even though it, it appears to you as one big blob, has structure inside of the hardware chips. So there's, you know, when you apply a certain address, it goes to a bank, and, you know, it gives you the, the bits that are there. Now, if you split your data across multiple banks, that's not good. And that's what alignment is trying to prevent you from doing. And that's all it's doing. Right? So that's the time to do the hardware. Yes. Yes. If you had an arbitrarily addressed memory, like, you know, that if you didn't care about how it was implemented underneath, then this would make no sense, right? Like it, it doesn't matter. You know, you store a long at, you know, hex thirty three and it should you know, if you don't care about how it's implemented underneath, then yeah, you should be able to organize your 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 data that way. This is sort of understanding that uh, when it's down into the hardware, when you're in the memory chips, or even yeah, anywhere where it's implemented, you're usually storing memory in blocks, in rows, in discrete sort of collections of bytes, mm -hmm. and then you want your your integer to be within one collection and only one collection of bytes. That's the intuition. Okay, um, 
So in order to guarantee alignment, uh, if you have a struct of disparate types, then the compiler is going to insert gaps inside of your struct to guarantee that those simple data types are always aligned, that are always within the same row. Okay, so here is the alignment requirements in 64-bit uh, x86. Um, it's actually advised, it's not necessarily required, um, but the, the rule is, is if the data type has a size of k bytes, then the address must be a multiple of k. Uh, and this will ensure single memory access for that data type. Now with a character, character is one byte, you're guaranteed one memory access, right? So the alignment is one. It can be aligned arbitrarily in memory. Uh, for a short, a short is two bytes, so the member must be aligned on even addresses. You have to start on an even address in order to guarantee that both bytes of that short are on the same uh, memory block, basically. Um, so this means that the lowest bit of the address for a short has to be zero. Uh, similarly, the int and the float are four bytes, so the member must be aligned on addresses that are multiples of four. Okay, so the lowest two bits of the address storing uh, an int or a float have to be both zero. And then for the long, the double, and the pointers, uh, their size is eight bytes, and so their addresses have to be di divisible by eight in order to guarantee a single memory access. Uh, so the lowest three bits of their address must all be zero. Yes? The compiler is doing this for us, right? Yes. Okay, so this isn't like I have to implicitly say, hey, go to this memory. Right, so the compiler is doing the layout for you, uh, but it, it helps for you to know the layout so that you know how to organize your structs appropriately. And then when you're looking at, when you're doing assembly and looking at addresses and stuff, you can kind of reason like, oh, this must be an int because we've got your zeros, or okay. Yep, okay. yep, that's exactly it. So kind of you can speculate saying like when you create your struct, you first put like the char, and then you put like probably int, and then at the end you'll put the long and double. That's one way. In fact, uh, yeah, you, except you're stealing my slide. But oh, yes, sorry, <laughs> that's all right. All right, all right. <laughs> yes. I was just thinking about it. Yes, it yes, that's uh, that's great that you came up with it because then you'll remember that. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, you Good. mentioned it. So uh -huh. I was thinking that, like, maybe we can arrange them. In the first yep, that's a, that'll be in about 10 slides or so. Okay. So, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, so... The, uh, so we just talked about every member in a structure must satisfy its own alignment requirement. So if you have a character and you follow that uh, with a long, well, you're going to have to pad that character with a bunch of padding bytes in order to get that long to be a multiple of eight, an address that's a multiple of eight, right? So that's the, that's the deal with, with uh, structures and store, uh, allocating space for structure. Uh, moreover, uh, not only does each member have to uh, satisfy its own alignment requirement, the overall structure itself must also satisfy an alignment requirement that is the exact same as the largest alignment of any of its elements. And there's a reason for this. So if your structure has a long, then the alignment requirement for the whole structure also has to be 8. That means the address of that structure has to be a multiple of 8 if there's any element inside of it that's got a k of 8. It's so that you can have a bunch of these contiguous little memory. That's ex so yeah, so that's 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 a slide coming up too. But that's exactly why, right? Then you can guarantee that an array of structs are every single member in that array is also aligned. So these are rules that set things up so that you can have an array of structs defined and know that accesses to any element in that array of structs will be a single memory access. Doesn't that mean iterating through the array of those objects is all like set offsets as well? So you can yes. Optimizations you can do optimizations and make it go faster, which is the whole reason we're going through this, yeah, yeah. is to see, no, no, this is good, because yeah, if you see the higher level reason why we're doing these things, then it's easy to remember what the, so it's the rules. So possible the compiler to do that for you. Yes. Instead of you trying to like. Yes, okay. that's true. So um, if your if your um, uh, is your memory manager going to try to allocate your memory to the start for the page alignment? Or is it, is it, mm -hmm. 
Um, well, it's definitely going to allocate you a page. Right. Uh, whether or not it's I mean, smart like, enough to make sure that your entire array of structs stays on one page, do don't know. Okay. Uh, definitely on the stack, it has no choice. It can't just say, oh, I'll start a new page here. It doesn't work <laughs> like that because these addresses are contiguous. Uh, so if it runs off the page, it does need to spill over onto a new page. Uh, the other data segment, don't know. So like your first allocation. I think what it's it's going to do the, the dumb thing, and it's just going to go. Uh, I'm going to take your. So we talked about the dot data section and the dot read only data section. It's just going to take those and sequentially allocate that in a page. I don't think it's smart enough. Uh, no, I mean it's just going to. I don't know actually, but I, my guess is that it's probably going to do it sequentially. Uh, okay. Um, so here's some examples. Uh, you have a struct S2. It's got a double, an array of two integers, and a character. Uh, the alignment requirement of the double is 8, of the ints are 4, and the character is 1. So the, um, the alignment requirement for the entire struct has to be 8 because of the double. It's the maximum. And so uh, one of the things is after you do this allocation, you, make, you have to make sure that the size of S2 is a multiple of 8. And you have to add padding to make sure that that size is a multiple of 8. Okay. And moreover, uh, this P, uh, that address has to also be a multiple of 8. So this is what it looks like allocated. You put the uh, double X. This is 8 bytes. This is a multiple of 8 P. So this is at the, uh, at the beginning. You have the double X, which is 8 bytes. You have your two integers, which brings you up to 16 bytes. You have the character C, which adds a 17th byte, but you cannot end this struct on the 17th byte because it's not a multiple of 8. The next multiple of 8 is over here at 24. So you pad by 7 bytes the end of this struct. Is that clear? Is, yeah. So does that mean that if you have something that's not going to be completely full, um, like you can add extra variables then to make it just as good, yeah. and just as efficient, and it's, so it's just like it's like kind of like free memory because you assume that that memory is already used for something. Yep. Cool. Yeah, you could add bogus members to confuse the person reading your code. <laughs> <laughs> you could hide. Uh, yeah, you could hide information in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could have like a little cave oh, in there, like a code cave. Yeah, yeah, that happens. Uh, code caves are little unallocated regions in memory that you know are there but don't, you know, access explicitly. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, this is uh, memory that got allocated either way. So yeah. I mean, if you've got like if you're using enough data space that you're having to um, run into another bottleneck while you're swapping your data. Mm-hmm. Ah, but we are no, no, many yeah. times now. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so you look at like like most of the laptops all in like six, six, so you're dealing with yes. more than four gigs of RAM in one of them. Well, it depends on how dinky you're. Like, I mean, they really do range from you know, mini computers to basically nothing, like these tiny sensor moats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you. The Raspberry Pi has I, I, uh, like has an ARM on it. On That's it. like a mini computer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. all right. Here's another example. Uh, S3 has got uh, an array of floats, an array of ints, and a character C. So alignment requirement is four, four, <laughs> one. So the the total is four due to the float and the int. Uh, when you lay this out in memory, it has to be a multiple of four because of this. And then P has to also be a multiple of four. This is what it looks like. You have the two integers at uh, offset of zero and four. And then the two integers are, or two floats, sorry, two floats at zero and four, the two integers at eight and 12. And again, C is at 
byte 17. But because the alignment requirement is 4, you only need 3 bytes of padding to get to the next multiple of 4, which is 20. So the size of this struct is going to be 20, and the size of that one is going to be 24. Yeah. Could you access that first x and treat it like a double in the second struct? So I say that, that second struct there is an x3. Is that a float, right? Two floats make a double. Mm -hmm. so can oh, I no, no, these, these are 32-bit floats. Oh. And you're like, you're trying to see if you can get the whole thing as a double? No. Your programming assignment should have, you know, you should, you should see that, yeah, those things are, you need a real conversion to, to get it into a double. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Completely different, uh, not concatenatable. Yeah, well, I was saying if you could use that to make it so that your memory space is more efficient, and then use it as if it was not a double. Uh, we'll talk about this. The, those are called unions. Uh, and I'll, end of this, end of this, we'll get to unions. All right, uh, practice problem. What is the alignment requirement? What is the size of this uh, struct? And then draw it, just like I drew the other ones. And it's a little trickier than the previous examples, which is uh, intentional. So th the way you can conceptually think about this is that you're accessing memory as in blocks. You know, whenever you go to a memory location, you're, you're getting blocks out of the chip. And those blocks are contiguous from like 0 to 16, and then from 0 to 15, then 16 to 31, blocks of bytes. So you're getting, you're getting them in, you're not getting a single byte or four bytes at a time, or you know, you're actually getting a row of memory locations all at once. So if you look at the memory bus, you're actually getting um, a chunk of memory back, and it's basically corresponding to a row based on how the memory chips are storing data, right? You can't just give it an arbitrary location and it get, give me the next 16 bytes following this address. You're actually uh, giving it addresses that are multiple of 16, for example, if, the, if they're organized in 16 byte blocks, and then you're getting one row of 16 bytes. Now, if your integer or your long is stored across rows, then you're ask, accessing that memory bank twice to get both halves of your of your integer or your long. Uh, oh, so in some one of these blocks where you can store multiple data, like literally yeah. this whole this whole thing is like, oh, there's an int here, a character here, here. It's all in these sixteen bytes as one thing in memory. Yeah. Yeah. And please go ahead. No, oh, I was gonna say, and that's why you don't want it somewhere else, because then it's gotta make that jump instruction. And, and it's probably not the next physical block of memory, it's probably you know, a thousand Pot whatever. potentially. Right. Yeah. And that's the issue. Yeah. And so the padding is just to make sure no other memory yeah, and to make sure that every single simple data type is stored in one, has one block, of, like, uh, is within one block, not okay. split across multiple. And then my other question is, if we have a bunch of doubles and it's going to go past these 16 bytes on that memory, it's going to be literally the next step in memory, right? Because yes. It, it, you're going to have to retrieve those two blocks. Yep. And that's the whole alignment deal. It's like, it'll be just that next step. Yeah, and it'll and those will be aligned as well. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? All right. So what is K for S one? Is eight because of this double? Uh, what is the size? Twenty four. Twenty four. Twenty four. So this is four. Well, three. Uh, one byte plus three padding. Uh, and so this is four bytes, this is uh, eight bytes, but then because this is, uh, oh, actually, let me draw it. <laughs> so here is the character C, and in order to get to a multiple of four, this is a single byte, you have to put three bytes in here. So then you can put two integers here at offsets of four and eight. This will end at 12, but that's not a multiple of eight. And your next thing needs to be aligned on a multiple of eight. So that's why you need an extra four bytes here. And then you can store your double V. And then the whole thing is a multiple of eight. So then you don't need any padding after the double. What about the pointer C? Uh, yeah. this, this is the, so I use that to actually start the, start okay. the structure. Yeah, okay. that's why it's a star P, yeah. Hey, Zane, why are you 
Uh, for the two integers, they need to be aligned on a multiple of four. And then, uh, but the size has to be a multiple of eight. Uh, and then the alignment of V has to be on a multiple of eight as well. Yeah. Don't you need like size or the pointer P? Don't you need something for that? No, no, this is just declaring P to be a pointer to this struct so that I could put it down here uh -huh. as P. Yeah, that's the only, that's the only reason that's there. Yeah. There's a pointer to one of these things, so that's... So you're almost like making an array. Yeah. Yeah, and this P has to be a multiple of eight because that, in order to make this an alignment, struct align with a multiple of eight. Um, hmm. You guys want to do more of these? Why don't you do the first couple? Those are the easier ones. The first two. Uh, so what you're doing is the uh, offset of each field, the total size of the structure, and then the alignment requirement of the structure. And then you can do the other three after class if you Okay, so uh, P1, uh, int i is at 0, it's 4 bytes, so character C is at 4. Because this integer has an alignment requirement of 4, you have 3 pad bytes after the character to get to offset of 8. And then uh, character D is stored right after the integer at, at 12. And then again, you have to make sure that the entire structure is a multiple of 4. So this is why uh, the entire structure is 16 bytes. Uh, the second one, uh, you have the integer i. The character c is at 4. You have another character d, which follows it. So that actually can be stored at an address 5. Uh, and then you have a long j. Now, in order to store the long, you have to get all the way out to 8, address 8. So this is why the offset of long is 8. So that uh, forces you to put uh, two pad bytes in there. And so this is a 16-byte struct as well. Yeah. So if you had one more char in this struct, it would be like 20 bytes. So, it, so the entire, so if I like after the long chain, there was like a char. Uh, so then you would have 24 bytes because the alignment requirement is 8. Okay. So if there was a character right after this j, then uh, you would need seven, seven bytes of padding to make the multiple of eight. Okay, now I understand. Kyle doesn't care about the pad bytes, does it? Like how, how it's reading that memory. It's irrelevant if there's padding bytes in the middle or in the end. It's going gonna, it's it's gonna to allocate it. It's, it's, it's injecting the padding bytes, so right. yeah. yeah. And it wouldn't mess with efficiency of the padding. Was it, like, if, it, if you arranged it right and did like long, in the float and then a character and then have the padding at the very end. Is that any That's the efficient? best way to do it. That is the best way. Yeah. So having the padding in the middle bad. Pretty much. Great. So in fact that's the next is that the next slide? Uh, oh yeah, it is the next slide. So you can reorder this thing to reduce waste. So here is character double, character int. Uh, you put the character in, you need seven bytes of pad. 
Then you've got the double, because the double was next, you need seven bytes of pad. And then uh, after the double, a character can be placed immediately after, but then you have an integer. So then to get to the next multiple of four, you have to add four bytes. Mm -hmm. So this is four plus seven, wait, no, three, sorry, three pads of bytes. So three, byte, three bytes here, seven bytes here, 10 bytes wasted. If you reordered it from largest to smallest, then here is your double, then you put your int, and then your two characters, uh, you still need to satisfy the overall alignment requirement. The mul this has to be a multiple of eight, so you do have two pad bytes at the end to bring that all the way up to 16. Yep. Uh, no, you have to. Yeah, yeah, I, I figured it's compiler too. Yeah, you have to. Yes. All right, uh, so this gets at what Brian just said. Uh, when you get something like this, uh, uh, okay, I'm just going to give you the byte offsets. There's a bunch of padding in there. Uh, the total size of this structure, if you do the math and add all the pads, is 56 bytes. And then what you want to do to rearrange the structure to minimize space is exactly what he said. Put the biggest ones at the top, uh, go down in decreasing size order. Uh, so in this case, you store A, which is a character pointer, which is 8 bytes, and C, that's at 8 bytes. And G, that's eight bytes. So first, those are the first three. And then you go with the float E, which is four bytes. And H, which is four bytes. That's these two. And then your B, which is this short, which is two bytes. And then D and F, which are both single bytes. If you arrange this in this order, uh, you get a 40 byte structure. And that's the difference. Uh, no, I believe you are supposed, the programmer is meant to do this. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, the compiler is allowed to rearrange your local variables because there's no um, semantic associated with doing that apparently, uh, but not the structs as far as I know. But again, I'm old school C89 right now, so maybe. Um, yeah, probably to refactor your C code uh, automatically. I'm sure. Yeah, that that's probably got to be an easy program to write. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason why we jump through all these hoops is that when we allocate arrays of structures, uh, we want to just be able to guarantee alignment on everything that's in that array, which is what we referred to earlier. And so uh, when you have an array of these structs. The, the way this is allocated is to just repeat the struct allocation contiguously, just like any array. Uh, and so what you do is if there is this, if this is the internal allocation of this struct, it's got the integer and then some, uh, a short, some pad, and then a float, and then a short, and then some more pad. What it'll do is for this, it will just repeat this over and over again uh, in its allocation. And then it can ensure that if you do an arbitrary access to any element here, then they're all aligned. And that's what having this be a multiple of the alignment requirement really helps you do. It keeps that starting address of the array element as a multiple, uh, as the correct multiple. So that's basically, this is the result of everything that we just talked about is what we're getting to. This is, this is why we're doing it. Oh yeah, I don't have this ordered well, but uh, at least operationally now, uh, uh, the, the code that gets generated to index this is much easier. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So this just recaps exactly what I stated. Following the rules, alignment is achieved on everything. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to skip this one too. Okay, so that's structs. Any questions about structs? That's all we're going to cover with it. Okay, so the next data type, which you probably haven't come across, is a union. Uh, and a union is a variable that looks like a struct, but all of the members of this union are laid on top of each other. They're all using the exact same memory location. And semantically, you have to, just like you uh, sort of, almost like a cast, where you're reinterpreting 
interpreting the bits differently based on the type that you're accessing it with. It's the same thing with a union. Uh, so you can access this union either as a character, as two integers, or as a single double, and it's stored in the exact same memory location, and you're typically using it as one type at a time. So this is really useful when you have resource-constrained systems, right? When you are, you know, you've got no memory or very little memory, and you want to use a single memory location for multiple purposes. So that's where you would get the union. Um, uh, the size of a union is the uh, maximum size of any of the individual data types that are uh, declared inside it. Okay. So here's a question. What is the size of this union U? So union U tag, it's got an int, a float, and a character pointer. What would be its size? It's the size of its maximum element, maximally sized element. It'd be eight bytes. It's the character pointer that's determining the size of this. Uh, let me stop using the old habit. So it's the uh, character pointer that's determining the size because that's the, the maximum element. Um, so after this code, uh, what does u contain after these three lines? You use it as an i integer value, you set the integer value to 14, then you access it as an, a floating point and you set it to 31.3, then you access it as a, a string pointer and you set it to the character pointer of the malloc of some string length. What do you think? It's going to have the character pointer, right? So this is all being stored on the same memory location, and so it's the result of the last instruction that accessed this that you would get. Okay. So when you say same memory location, you mean like base address zero? So say this is stored at hex 100. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, this is going to be hex 100 to hex 107. It's going to be stored in the eight bytes starting at hex 100. And when you do something like this, this is going to set those bytes at hex 100 to be the integer 14. And then as soon as you uh, do this assignment, then it's going to put the floating point representation, the 32-bit floating point representation of 31.3. It's going to put that at those eight bytes. But it's only going to use the bottom four bytes because it's a... So you can still point. access all three of these memories then? You can access them individually, but their value is based on the last thing that you assign to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does it zero out all the other... Yeah, and it would zero out the top end so that you're not using. The integer fill the, the whole thing for mm. right? Yeah. Okay. Um... What does this code print out? So we have the same union, an int, a float, a character pointer, sval. And there's a reason why I gave you this now instead of in chapter two, because it would have made the float convert level way easy. So what is this going to print out? If I take this union, I set the floating point value to 15,213.0, and then I do a printf of the hex representation of u.ival. What might that do? It doesn't do any conversion. Yeah, that would be the IEEE 32-bit floating point representation of 15,213, eh? Oh, yeah, that would have been helpful. I think most of you have finished the float convert level, because if you ha haven't, there's your shortcut right there, oh right? Because I gave you hexadecimal, right? You could actually set this iVal to that hexadecimal thing, and then do a printf percent f of u dot fval, and be, <laughs> and be done with that level. So yeah, you could do that in C by do using this union, going back and forth between the the hex representation and then the floating point value, back and forth. Okay, so any questions about that? That's unions. Uh, yeah, so this is the hex, so this is the IEEE, the hex representation of the IEEE float 15,213. So if you were given that, 
as part of your CTF level, then you would just put that in, and then you'd be done. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about are bit fields. Um, and this is a shortcut that you see in operating systems uh, and in like embedded devices. Um, if you have multiple Boolean variables, um, there's a way of saving space by making them bit fields rather than allocating a, an entire integer to each flag. So like the, um, for the condition code flag register, you know, each one of those is a single bit, but you don't want them to be in like individual registers. Uh, you want them to take up exactly one bit. So the same thing with flag fields, um, and this is used in device drivers and, and, and operating system calls. Uh, the example of this is the open library call. So when you want to open a file, typically you have to uh, tell the operating system how you want to open it. Do you want to open it for read-only access? Do you want to open it for read-write access? Uh, so these are flags that you send the library call, and the way they're implemented is using these constants, uh, o-create, uh, o-write-only, o-trunk, and these are bit fields of a single integer is basically how this so if you look at this parameter uh, open takes a string and an integer and the way you're using this integer you're going to address individual bits of the integer using these flags and the way this works uh, is to do something like this so if you um, when you include this open call I use the pointer when you include the open call in your C program, you have to include a file called fcntl.h, and this is the file that turns this, using the preprocessor, turns this into integers, or in this case, this is binary. These are binary, um, oh wait, no, it's octal. This is octal with a zero in front of it. <laughs> so I couldn't find a hex version. Uh, but basically these are single bits that are set in different locations of that integer, and that's how you specify whether or not the flag is, is on or off uh, based on these bit fields. So just wanted to show that to you because it's something that you might, you might come across. Um, here's an example of implementing it using hexadecimal, so this, this probably makes more sense. Uh, you could implement these flags as individual bits set in these hex constants. And then when you want to set these flags in your, so you have a flag field, you could say, hey, set the A bit and the B bit, and that would set the last two bits. And then uh, if you pass flags as an argument to like a, uh, a call, it can pick off those bits um, as a flag. What does only work to the actual bits you're saying? Uh, typically this is stored as an int, like you're using a single integer to pass this flag field and then you'd have 32 flags. So you could go A through Z and then start using other things. So. Yeah. You could use a char as well if you only had eight flags to send uh, and then it would just be uh, all in one byte. Uh, the other way to do bit fields is through uh, bit widths in structs. And so this is something you probably haven't seen before, but you can just take this struct and say, uh, this is an unsigned int, uh, and this, this uh, member has a bit width of one. And that will use a single bit, and if you see another one that uses a single bit, you can basically use the same unsigned int to store both of these flags. And the compiler will automatically figure out the bit positions in that integer to use for each one of these members. Okay, so out of convenience. Um, so uh, for this data structure with three members, uh, each one bit wide, uh, what is the size of this struct? Well, it's the size of the unsigned int that's used to store them, which would be four bytes in this case. Uh, but if you had 33 one-bit fields, then the size would be eight, uh, eight bytes, because then you'd have to have another integer storing that that spillover bit. Okay. So that's bit fields. Uh, and I just wanted to touch upon those things just because they might be useful for you in the future. Yeah. Also, uh, I looked up the structure like um, packing and a compiler, or whatever. The compiler does not ever touch like the ordering and anything of uh, 
members and structures because you can cast those to whatever you want to later. And that's a common uh, thing to do in real-level programming to like make it extended and like OP like super classes or whatever. Uh, okay, so recasting it and it has to be deterministic yeah. in the way it does the but also, layout. Also, the other thing you can do is uh, very often stuff so you use to map one to one with hardware. Uh huh. And so it's pointers to like absolute literal hardware. So like I can define a struct in uh, my program that like when I access a struct member, it turns on my keyboard or turns off my mouse. So like, so those are actually defined like one to one like ratio from memory to actual hardware. So I can't reorganize where everything's located because it's actual hardware. Okay. So like if I made a struct for a zip file. Uh huh. The zip file has you know the 